of those concentrated expansion of the bubble. Uh, so the bubble's not expanding. It's the light passing through the material that's already been released by the star. So we're getting kind of a, you know, it's, it, it's, I mean, light echo is a good illustration of that because what we're seeing is sort of a light, light echo off different parts of this cavity of gas as it, as it propagates outward. But it's not the gas itself that we're seeing yeah. moving. Much as like if we hear like we, in the canyon and we call over here, we hear it over there, and then we hear it over there, and then we hear it over there. It's not that my voice is traveling. It's just that the sound took some time to get to this point and then came back to us. It took some more time to get to that point and came back to us. That's kind of what's happening here. So this is, I've seen a sequence of images where it's like animated? It's completely opaque. Where it's completely opaque. Or not completely opaque, but more, it seems like there's no black space, it's sort of less black space. And then like in the, so these are two images which may be confusing. This the background image is the Hubble Deep Field. Okay. And then that's you can yeah. just barely see the little square right here. Yeah. Yeah. So but you see in, in the pictures of this you've seen there's no there's no sort of space in between here. Yeah. I'll look for it. The earliest the earliest phase is when it was the, that light echo was just coming out. Mm -hmm. This probably looked like a much more solid ball. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but as it's propagated out, it's sort of gone through bubbles of the material that's around there. But the material's not moving. But yeah. what we see of the material it's is taking far too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's actually a really good animation I saw t uh, today, in fact, on about 15 years of this this light echo, and it's smoothed out in such a way that it looks like a running movie, but it's pretty. Uh, sure. All right, why not? I have to go on Facebook to find it, though. Like I can't find the movie itself, but I mean that's that's sort of the snapshot version of it. Yeah. So you're talking about like the left side where yeah. So that's just you know the material is expanding out, and so when it's closest to the star, it's still pretty dense, but it sort of pops with these cavities. Yeah. So it's just like traveling out. Uh, or like bouncing around. The light is just traveling out. And all of this, these shells you see are just, so we talk about the AGB state phase where it's thermal pulsing and it's sending out its atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So this has done it, you know, for this star, it's done this for millions and millions of years. And so you're just seeing many, many repetitions of this stuff uh, forming sort of shells around the, the original star. Why is it like a pulse of light, though? Oh, well, so part of the pulsation yeah. phase is a sudden burst of light. Okay, so that's and the so, of light coming yeah. the shells. Awesome. And we're not used to this in terms of light because light, moves pretty fast, and like human time scales, right, human spatial scales. 
So if you shine a flashlight, it's basically instantaneous when it comes back to us when we're reflected. But imagine now scales that are light years across. Now it might take a year for that to come back at us. So there's a notable delay between when you send out a light pulse and when you see the thing that that light is actually interacting with. So that's kind of what's happening here. Light echoes are one of the most amazing, amazing things I see in astronomy. That we we actually see echoes of the supernova that went off like in you know a thousand A.D. We see the echoes of that light many many light years that you can actually calculate. It's about a thousand light years away from the where the explosion took place, bounced off and is now coming into our eyes. So we can see the light from that event. It's a thousand years old, back in reflection. It's really amazing. <clears throat> okay. Um, on that aside. So just a few announcements before we start. Um, this week is the last two we, uh, last week for our remote observing labs, and I thought today was going to be fantastic, but it actually looks kind of iffy. Uh, and so I will send around an email if that's going to happen or not. How many of you were planning on going today? Quite a few of you. Okay. Okay. So I will send out an email um, by about five o'clock because I'll know for sure when the community is uh, if it's going to go down enough that we can actually open. Um, if we can't open tonight, Thursday is the backup date, the final backup date. And how many of you who raised their hands absolutely cannot make it Thursday? OK, I feel less pressure then. OK. All right. Uh, but I'll send an email around uh, around 5 o'clock tonight. Uh, reminder that the project papers are due on Friday. Um, tomorrow, yes, sir? Uh, would it be from 7 to 9 on Thursday? Uh, so 7.30 to 9.30 are the dates I have to sort of set up for about half an hour. If you show up at 7, that's fine, because uh, for those of you who took the lab before, know that there's quite a bit of sort of preparation work for it. And so uh, you're happy, I'm happy for you to show up at 7. Tonight I will be there probably at 7.15, because there's another event that's going on campus. Uh, this Clark Center event that's happening. What, what about like 8.30 on Thursday? Uh, 8.30, you may be pushing it in terms of finishing the lab. So yeah. try to try to come as soon as you can. But you know, maybe tonight will work out. We'll see. I'm optimistic. Very early. Um, so the project papers due deadline uh, a deadline is Friday. Um, if you want to discuss the topic of your paper in the very last minute, uh, I will have office hours on Thursday. Um, but we can talk a little bit more about that then. Um, you can also see me after class. Remember that the other part of this project though is the presentation, which is during finals week. And so Wednesday, I'm going to, instead of having our discussion section, because we don't have homework, so there's not that much to discuss, um, I'm going to do a, just a quick little bit about how to do an effective presentation uh, for that. And you know, just to keep in mind that part of, so you know, the way I'm going to grade your presentations is whether it's clear that you understood the material that you studied and how effectively you would present that material. Uh, and so going to an effective presentation class might be useful for that part of your grade. Okay, um, So that'll be on Wednesday during um, discussion session. Um, I sent an email around this weekend that uh, CAVE evaluations are on right now. Um, and the deal is if 100% uh, of you send in your CAVE evaluations, that is free pizza. So you know, evaluate equals food. This is basic survival instincts. Right? Um, so I can see, and so don't worry about like, you know, like, I can tell how many evaluations. I don't actually see the evaluations, but I can tell how many there are. So right now, there's a third. Um, so uh, just you know, you can you can evaluate me any way you feel. Uh, I'm just looking for numbers, pure quantity, not quality. Um, there's another video I wanted to show you. So last week we talked very briefly about Comet Ison, and um, if you've been following the news, you may now know that Comet Ison is formally Comet Ison. Uh, these are a series of images taken uh, from uh, solar telescopes that are actually pointed at the sun. Uh, and normally, just watch the uh, solar outbursts that you can see streaming off the. It comes up here, right? So all these solar outbursts and uh, coronal mass ejections. This is what this satellite usually studies. There's a big one right there. But here comes Comet I Sun. Hello. All right, really bright as it's getting close to the sun. So that was the one day that we might have seen it, but we didn't. And as it passes through, now we see the just cloud of disrupted material. So we're pretty sure that Comet Ison has been torn into little pieces. Which is sad, because there's going to be a wonderful Christmas event to see this comet in the sky, but uh, actually we'll just have a whole bunch of dust, which we won't be able to see. I think there's another view of this, yeah. 
we have several satellites that are staring at the sun right now, and so we get actually quite a few interesting little views of, of it passing through. This, by the way, is actually an amalgam of two, uh, two instruments, one that is just looking straight at the sun at high energy radiation, so that's why it's got this sort of funny structure. This is all UV light from the sun, so it's tracing the uh, magnetic lines and the flaring lines. Uh, and then these wide angles to actually see the outflow of material coming off of it. So here's this is a great one. Ripped apart. And then actually, like there you see, the CME collides into it at the end there. It's really fun to watch these things interact. So it's been uh, a lot of uh, great data for the solar uh, system folks. But unfortunately, if you didn't see common ice on, which we didn't see common ice on that one day, that's it. I'll have to wait for the next one. OK. See how we get back here. There was an XKCD recently. Was oh, was there? Very relevant to that. <laughs> to, to the comet or to? To the comet, yeah, basically. Uh, you want to give us the punchline? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So that's your homework. <laughs> I guess KCD. Um, last announcement there's a uh, so we, see we have uh, an astrophysics seminar this week, which is actually a galaxy formation. I think is like the ninth galaxy formation talk we've had in 10 weeks. Um, the physics seminar is actually going to be quite interesting because it's actually about a topic we haven't discussed very much, but you will discuss when you get to uh, 161 and 162, and that's dark matter. We don't talk about dark matter very much because we don't see any dark matter stars yet because we can't see dark matter, so not very useful. Um, but dark matter is, of course, a very prominent part of uh, very, uh, you know, the majority of the mass, 85% of the mass uh, in the universe. And so uh, it's one of those things that it's uh, definitely ripe for a Nobel Prize. And so there are many, many uh, projects going on to actually detect what we think might be one possible um, manifestation of dark matter, which would be these particles called WIMPs that we don't know. And WIMPs is weakly interacting massive particles. Weakly interacting means it's not interacting strongly, which would be through electromagnetic interactions. That's why there's no light. But they might interact through the weak force. Uh, and so there are uh, predictions that if that's the case, uh, if it collides with certain atoms, it can actually deflect those atoms gravitationally or deflect them through a weak interaction. Uh, and that's something you could actually detect. So this talk is on one of these experiments called LUX, which I think is a beautiful name because it's you know Latin or Greek for light, which is not what they're looking for. They're looking for dark. Uh, and of course, if you're looking for dark matter, you want to go in a dark place. And so this is actually a mile underground in a mine in South Dakota. Uh, and they have a chamber which is about um, uh, 250 kilograms, about a quarter ton of xenon. Uh, it turns out that xenon uh, is a very good uh, substance for this kind of work because uh, it's not, you know, these are Nobel gases and so they don't interact with each other. They don't form bonds, um, but they can interact freely with particles that pass through the, through the chamber. Uh, and so this is just an illustration of what they think could happen is if you have a this dark matter particle, which we don't know what it is, comes through here, uh, could elicit a, an interaction with uh, one of the xenon particles uh, and set a sort of chain of motion of a bunch of things like a collision uh, cascade of electrons coming off and photons coming out just because the xenon is being uh, probed, not from the dark matter, but from the xenon interaction. Uh, and by measuring it from both ends, they can actually figure out the exact place where this interaction took place and then speculate from there how, how many of these particles there actually are as they shoot through. Their estimate is that if, if, if this is what dark matter is, and this is a big if, uh, that, that you know, there's something like 10 or 12 of these in the chamber at any given time, uh, which seems like a lot, kind of. Um, but of course, the question is how much do they interact? Now, we talked about nuclear interactions before. We use this unit called barns, which is you know, the broad side of a barn. If you can hit a proton, you hit the broad side of a barn in terms of particle physics. Uh, they're measuring scales that are down to zepto-barn scales, uh, 10 to the minus 49 meters squared, um, much, much smaller than any particle that we can think of in nature. But this just reflects the fact that it's extremely improbable to have an interaction. So you have to have a really big chamber. Uh, and you have to, actually, the hardest part of this is that lots of stuff collides with xenon in these underground mines. There's radioactive material all around you. There's muons from the atmosphere coming in and causing interactions. So you have to do a lot to sort of basically get rid of all the backgrounds, which is 99.9999999% of the stuff you see, and hope you can extract the you know five events that tell you you found dark matter. Tough experiment, right? 
But interesting, if they actually do detect something, they'll win Nobel Prizes and be rich and famous. And we can say we saw them give a talk here at UCSD. All right, so that's on Thursday, uh, if you want to see that. All right, any questions? <clears throat> All right. Uh, so we've been talking about and I think you can get the lights again, please. We have been talking about uh, the end states of stars. Um, and uh, last week I showed this diagram of sort of the different outcomes that stars have. If you have a low mass star, uh, you uh, end up with a core of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen that is not hot enough uh, to fuse and not massive enough to actually collapse under its own weight. Uh, and so you end up with this core that doesn't do anything. And at that stage, this AGB stage, which we had that picture of the sort of light echo passing through the, the dust left over from this AGB star, uh, that's the atmosphere going away, no longer able to push this thing down, and you end up just with an exposed core. What do we call that? Light core, yeah. And the core, so you know, through the stellar evolution, it's burned all its hydrogen in the core, it's burned all its helium in the core. So that's why we're left with carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and oxygen. But of course, what we see is the surface of this white dwarf, which may actually have other stuff on it, depending on how much of the atmosphere actually has kicked out. So sometimes we see helium on these surfaces. Sometimes we see hydrogen on the surfaces. Sometimes we just see carbon stuff, which makes these really weird swan bands of cyanide uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, and so that all has to do with how this star actually went through its final sort of death rows getting rid of the atmosphere. Um, now, that's not the only end state, of course. We talked about that more massive stars can form neutron stars or black holes, or they can explode entirely uh, and leave absolutely nothing left over. Uh, and so we're going to start looking a little bit more at sort of the limits of where that transition happens. Right? What is the maximum mass? Essentially, we're looking at what is the maximum mass of a white dwarf before that is now massive enough and gravity can overcome, in this case, generously pressure, not thermal pressure. Uh, to actually cause this thing to collapse and start other nuclear reactions, or even blow itself up. Okay, so now, uh, so degeneracy pressure was an important point because uh, we can estimate things like the central pressure and the central density of these white dwarfs. All right, remember that these are things that have masses that are order a solar mass and radii of order an Earth radius. Anybody know what an Earth radius is? In SI units? 6,400 kilometers. Yes. Or how I like to remember it is about 6 million meters. Because that's poetic. 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters or 6,400 kilometers, if I was right. right. So something that's 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms squeezed into something that's only 6 times 7 to the 6 meters across. Uh, we can get estimates for these core density and pressure by just going back to our uh, relations for polytrope relations, right? We found that if you have something that is a polytrope, what is a polytrope? Pressure dependent on density, some power density. Some power, yeah. So pressure just depends on the density, right? And when we make that assumption, we can actually calculate what the model of the star is uh, just using our fundamental stellar, stellar structure model. So we always had this case where the central density was equal to some number times the average density, right? N equals one half, that's that number six, right? N equals three, I think it's like 15.7 or something like that. All right, these are numbers you calculated in your homework assignment. Um, if you go through the calculation of this, and so if you just take the average density, one solar mass divided by four pi r cubed over three in volume, forget the number for now. This works out to be something like 10 to the 9 kilograms per meters cubed. That's dense, man. Right? Uh, that's, I mean, that we don't have anything that's that dense here on Earth. So already we see that this must be some kind of unusual form of matter if we can actually squeeze it out of this kind of density. Yes, sir? Wait, is this a neutron star or just star? This is a white dwarf. White dwarf. White dwarf. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about neutron stars. Neutron stars are a bit more massive than the size of Manhattan. 10 kilometers. Way, way, way even worse. And it's back so bad that it's now past nuclear densities for, for the nucleus of, of atoms. And so you start worrying about other weird stuff there. We'll get to that. Um, let's just start with the white dwarf. So, really high density. 
All right, the essential pressures. Anybody remember how we can scale this according to bigger bulk properties? And remember the upscaling relation or polytrope or central density? MRT? What is it? MRT? Nope. The yeah, squared over R. Yeah, exactly. So some number, again, which we have to figure out from our polytrope model, gm squared over r to the fourth. And you can just do the, you know, do the, the unit conversion, right? gm squared over r squared is the force divided by two more r's is an area, force over area of pressure. Right? So dimensionally, you can just figure that out. All right, so if you do that calculation, you get something like 2 times 10 to the 27 newtons per meter squared which is, sounds like a big number. What does it mean? Well, this is the equivalent here on Earth of taking 10 to the 9 kilograms, all right, a million tons, and putting it on something that is, uh, oops, no, sorry, that's another one. 10 to the 6 kilograms, so just 1,000 tons, tiny, right? A, you know, a few dozen elephants. But squeezing them onto a point that's only an angstrom across. That's weird. Right? So that's pretty extreme. Pretty extreme pressure, right? A few little 10, 10 elements on you know, your fingertip is tiny compared to this. All right. So um, it suggests that we have to think a little bit more carefully when we're solving this about what actually the matter is doing when it's being squeezed by all this mass on top. It's being pulled in by itself by gravity. Uh, and that will change how, uh, at what point this thing starts to collapse. So, in fact, the state of matter that we're talking about is degenerate matter. And we've already talked about this a couple times before. We did a homework assignment on it with brown dwarfs, because brown dwarfs tend to be mostly degenerate matter. Um, but let's go into a little more detail. Now, whenever we're talking about new states of matter, uh, this gets us back to our discussion of the density of states, right? How you organize all the atoms together, right? These are our distributions of particles. Uh, we've talked about, for example, the Max Planck distribution, uh, where the number density of particles as a function of energy uh, scales as e to the one half times the exponent of e to the e over kt. All right, and then there's a bunch of constants out in front, just so you get something that's normalized equal one. Right. Remember that this came from assuming that the <coughs> Velocities are this, themselves distributed according to an exponential distribution, which is what you would get for just standard entropy sort of estimates. Right? The number of states, entropy is a measure of the number, the log number of states. So the number of states is the e to the entropy, right? And then we can we can stick in energy over kT to get that entropy out, right? What kind of gas is this? An ideal gas. An ideal gas. Right? So once you know this distribution, you can do things like calculate the pressure of this gas uh, by just doing an integral of one-third nV squared over all possible velocities. Uh, you can calculate the average energy per particle, which is 3 halves kT. Right? You can do all sorts of things to figure out what the average statistical properties of this gas are based on this distribution. Uh, and just for visually, of course, this distribution looks something like Something like this, all right? Drops off fast at zero energies and drops off exponentially at high energies. And the peak here is something like 3 halves kT. Okay? That has described most of the matter we've talked about in this class, all right? The interior of the sun, the atmospheres of all the stars we've talked about, ideal gas is pretty much good enough. Even if the material is ionized, it's still pretty much good enough. Now, we have another set of, so, so this is for any particles. I'm going to focus a little bit now on electrons, as we'll see why in a second. We've also seen electrons in other systems that doesn't look like an ideal gas. Anybody remember another system of electrons that we've talked about that wouldn't actually be, look like this at all? No, electrons and fermions, so the, the good question, good, 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 good answer. So Fermi Dirac, yes, uh, and we will we'll, we'll touch on that just a little bit. But I think of a simpler system, something that, you know, we teach in chemistry all the time. 
Yeah, exactly. Electron orbitals, right? You've got a, a nucleus with a bunch of neutrons and protons in the middle, and a whole bunch of orbital elements where you've got various numbers of electrons in them, depending on the angular momentum uh, of that particular orbital state. And what is this distribution of energy, number density versus energy? <clears throat> You, you did this. So is it a smooth distribution? Is it linear? A what? A dying exponential. A dying exponential. I don't know what that is. <laughs> can, you, can you draw? <laughs> Oh, a dying, oh, dying, okay, I thought there was like a person named Dying. <laughs> They're exponential dying. Uh, so you want, you want something like this? Yeah. Okay. Any others? The energies are discrete and you get a discrete number. Oh. So what, what do you think it looks like? Like a little, um, what's called bar graph, where there's yeah. two and all right. Or, let's see what's the easiest way to draw this. Two. All right. And on the x axis, can that be a negative 13.6? Sure. Sure, it can. Okay. And you can jump to what's the next one? Six. <clears throat> All right. I'll go for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what is? how do we write down the energies of these orbitals? Minus 13.6 over n squared. Minus 13.6 over n squared, yeah. So this is the n equals 1 state. So n equals 2, divide that by 4. So that's closer to 3, negative 3 electron volts. All right, so maybe that's that's here, let's say that, minus 3 something. How many particles per that level do we have? Yeah. Never thought you'd have to use chem 6a again. Six or eight, okay. Two n squared. Two n squared, right? So we're at n equals two, so it's eight. Numbers, eight. Yeah, numbers, yeah. <laughs> numbers are hard. <laughs> so eight, all right. An exponential where it's asymptotically reaching like reaching zero. Uh well so what's the next step here? Four. What's the next energy step here? Yeah, so one one something, right? Minus one something, right? So it actually gets a little closer, and then of course this goes up to two n squared is eighteen. So this is now off my chart because I didn't draw my chart. So it's like that, all right? So it does look a little exponential, but it's not a pure exponential. In fact, more importantly, it's not a smooth function, right? Things are just piled up wherever they can be. Now, this was a special case of an atom. This is an atom in its ground state. So electrons don't necessarily have to be in these lowest states, right? I can keep this up and I can ionize, not, I don't have to ionize, right? I can just excite this electron over here, right? And add a, a more, well, actually, I can't go too far because here's zero. So there's a limit, right? But I can start pot shape, you know, I can certainly trade these around and that will depend on the temperature. And we did a whole, you know, week on this where we looked at the, you know, the distributions of electrons based on temperature, right? Both bound and free electrons, right? But this is a very different distribution than this, yeah? So it's going to have very different properties. And it's a distribution, particularly we're talking about a ground state atom, where the electrons are piled up into their lowest possible energy states. That's what we call the ground state, right? So if we have just, for example, helium, we don't have any of this stuff. We just have one bar which corresponds to the two electrons. They're in the ground state, n equals one state, and that's it. That's the distribution. Pretty boring. <laughs> but that's where the electrons are. So, you know, we talk about free distributions like ideal gases or some functions, but you can also have discrete distributions like this. Now, of course, free distribution, so this is a special case, right, because they have this special structure that's basically imposed by the electrostatic potential and the quantization of the energy in this extra-electrostatic potential, right? That's where all these n squared equals n squared stuff like that come from. Uh, but we're now talking about the insides of a white dwarf, 
which is certainly going to be much too hot. They have electrons bound up in atoms. Uh, but it turns out that this kind of picture of just piling all electrons down to the lowest energy state is something that we can actually use to describe white dwarfs. Because as we'll see, 3 halves kT uh, is going to turn out to be much too low to explain the very high density of electrons in here. They end up piling up so much that they actually fill up all the low energy states, just like they do in hydrogen atoms. Okay? So what does that look like? So for a degenerate gas, just schematically, the distribution looks more like this. Uh, and so actually, we'll make it very clear. Degenerate gas at zero temperature. And we'll see why in a second why that's a perfectly good approximation for the insides of white dwarfs. Even though they're really hot, zero temperature turns out to be a good model because that temperature is much lower than what we'll define as the Fermi temperature. All right, so if you've piled up all of the electrons into the lowest energy states, and keep in mind that they're Fermi particles, and so you can only pile so many up in one given state, how many is that, by the way? Two, two right? So this is a distribution that starts at two, and you just pile them all up, up until some point in which you've got all the electrons. And you're done. Boy, that's an easy distribution to work with. Yeah. So we, did, we, yeah, we did this in the homework. And we defined this energy limit to be the Fermi energy. Right? And again, remember, one of the integrals that we can do with this is that if we integrate the number density per energy over all energies, we get the total number density. So the number that's fit in here is actually the number total number density, or the number per volume. So I'm going to figure out what that volume is in just a second. Right? But that's what the integral of this, of this expression is, of this distribution is. Right? So it's a known quantity, which means we can calculate this, which we'll do in just a second. All right, now we did something similar to this when we talked about uh, the black body distribution for photons. Right? So uh, it's going to sound like a very similar de uh, derivation, um, but we'll have one really important change, which gives us uh, the Fermi energy here. So in the same thing we did before, let's just take a volume of gas uh, with size L. I think I put them on the right places. Okay, Just a square. We're just going to sample one little region of this degenerate gas. Um, and um, we want to think about this in terms of uh, a very similar way we did the energy, we did the photons before. We want to think about the, the, that the electrons fit entirely inside these boxes. All right, so we're kind of taking the smallest possible box that we can put an electron in. Now, remember that electrons, you know, like, like photons, have a wave property to them. And if we were designing a box in which we fully contain an electron, we're essentially saying the same thing where we are containing the electron's wave function to lie within this box. Or if it's a high energy electron, we might be able to fit two in there because wave function has shrink, shrunk. But we have a sort of quantization of how many electrons we can fit in here based on whether their their wavelengths, their de Broglie wavelengths, fit inside this box. Is that clear? We did the same thing with gas, photon gas. Right? We said here's a box, photons fit in here, so they must end at the at the edges of the box. We're gonna do the same thing with the electrons. So we do a ex similar expression. The wavelength. In this case, the Broglie wavelength of the electron has to fit in this box, and that's just going to be uh, 2L, because you can have half a wavelength in the box. It goes to zero at you know, full and half of the wavelength as well, divided by some number of nodes for that wave. All right, so the wave might be this. It might be this. But in every case, we set that this wave function goes to zero at the edge of the box, because we want to fully contain that electron. Okay. All right. So we can do the same thing for the y direction and the z direction. And then remember again that we are not talking about wavelengths of light, where we could just set this equal to h c over nu, for example, to connect it to the wavelength, or we can set it to uh, the energy h c over e, right? We're connecting to the Broglie wavelengths. In which case, what is the de Broglie wavelength of a of a an actual massive particle? 
you remember? MC over. There's mass in it. There's mass in it. You're right. You're absolutely right. Mass B minus. So is uh, if you have a high mass, so you have a higher mass, does Rovi wavelength go down or up? Okay. So it should depend on one over the mass, right? Okay. If you have a high energy particle at a given mass, and you just increase the energy, does the Rovi wavelength go up or down? Goes down. Okay. Photon. Higher energy photon has shorter wavelength. Photons are different. Photons don't have Rovi wavelengths. Because they have no mass. It's always the it's so you keep the mass the same, but increase energy. Yeah, so I have one electron that's just sitting there. And one electron that's going super close to speed of light. <coughs> Which one has the larger Rovi wavelength? Which one with the lower energy? Which one with the Higher energy would be if I mean my efficiency side would be more detectable, like you'd be able to find more of that energy at one. The energy would be distributed by both or hmm. Sharper. He said you should merge it. Um, I had not thought about that argument. I'll think about it a little bit. So the way I think about it is it lets you take it to extremes. Like anytime you're trying to estimate things, take it to an extreme. What if we have part of it's going to the speed of light? Or close to the speed of light? What happens to its mass? Right, so let's not go all the way. So we'll go pretty fast. It gets bigger, right? Yeah. So if growth building depends on mass, and energy starts to feed into mass as we go faster and faster, growth wavelength should scale as one over the energy, or one over the speed to go. All right, so I'll kill the suspense with H over P. Okay, so that means that for each of these directions, x, y, and z, we can write down the momentum in a given direction, or the momentum of the particle, as h n x over 2L. All right, same thing for y and same thing for z. And then if we're writing down the energy in the non-relativistic case, and we'll get to the relativistic case in a little bit, but in the non-relativistic case, what is the energy of this particle? Remember, it's a free particle. Right? We're just talking about the inside of this white dwarf. It's not bound to any electron. Uh, how about P's? Oh, uh, P over 2L. Okay. P squared over 2L. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And P squared is a total momentum squared. So it's Px squared plus Py squared plus Pz squared. All right. So we can actually gather all of these terms. Uh, we get uh, 1 over 2m, because we have that from there. We have h squared over 4l squared. And then we have nx squared plus ny squared plus mz squared. Okay. Following so far. OK, so keep in mind, the way we got this is we're assuming that these are, we're, we picked a box where we're fitting a bunch of electrons. They have to stop at the edges of the boxes. So that sets a constraint on the Broglie wavelength of the particles. Uh, but you can have lots of different Broglie wavelengths, because as you go up to energy, the Broglie wavelengths shrink. And so you can fit 2, or 4, or 8, or some other number, depending on whether you get to the end of the boxes and kill that wave function. And so the energy distribution just depends on this combination of, of ends. So what is the total energy? What is the total number of states? Because these are energies, so the, these are energy states. Right? Nx is a state, and y is a state, and z is a state. And so we can add up the total number of states. It's just equal adding up all of the possible ends we can have up to some point where we no longer have any particles that are at that high energy. Remember, this is the distribution we're going for. So we can keep adding up energy states until we run into this last energy state, which is the Fermi energy, which contains all of the particles in that box. Right? So that's just saying that's just equal to, uh, no, actually, I'll draw this first. If it's just adding up all of these end states, we can actually draw a little volume here that. Uh, 
where all these end states lie. And these are, of course, discrete states along these lines. So we end up with kind of a volume of states. I think that looks close enough, right? But they're all positive, right? We don't have negative energy states. So we're not filling this, this n space uniformly. We're filling it up in only one corner where all the values are positive, right? So if we want to count all the states, what we're essentially doing is we're, count, we're measuring the volume of n's, right, states, up to a maximum n, which corresponds to a maximum energy, which we'll talk about as a Fermi energy. And yeah, it's written as nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared. It's a radius. We're going up to some maximum n radius here. Right? So the total over states is just the volume of this, this eighth of a sphere. One eighth times four pi over three times the maximum n cubed, um, and then times two because there are electrons and there's two spin states. Okay. Again, we did this. We did this, and we talked about the electricity and magnetism, or we talked about the photon gas, uh, and that's how we actually got parts of the black body distribution. Uh, the part that is sort of the, as you go to higher energies, it tails off. Right. This is similar because it's going to start tailing off as we get to to higher energy here. But in fact, we're setting a limit to how many states we have based on this this illustration of what we think our energy distribution should look. Okay. Well, we have a relation between n and e, so we can very quickly write this as pi over 3 times 8ml squared over h squared times its maximum energy to the 3 halves power. <coughs> so I just did a bunch of algebra to fix this in here, but that's, that's what we get if we just replace our n squared with with the actual energy value we have. Following? Yes, sir. One eighth because it's just H. Oh, sorry, this is H. Uh, here, I'll make it clear here. We've got one step here where this is equal to one over two m times one over eight and l squared h squared times n squared. Nx squared plus Ny squared plus Nz squared is a n radius quantity. Okay, so I didn't just substitute an n squared into this n cubed, and that's why I have a three halves power. Okay, so this is the total number of states inside a box of psi L, and so if I want the number density of states as a function of energy, which is the whole point of this, right? that's just dividing this by L cubed, because that was my box. And so you get pi over 3, 8m over h squared, times this Fermi energy to the 3 halves power. And that sort of sets, so I've said this is two, but this is two if I look at just individual energy states. If I group this together into sort of more bunches of states because we have so many electrons here, we're looking at basically nearly continuous distribution um, because, you know, we have gazillions and gazillions of electrons in here, so we can treat it as statistical continuous distribution. Uh, so that sets the sort of uh, the, the vertical scale for this number. And this is true for zero less than E less than E F. Now, this is the number and density of states. Actually, I should be very clear. This is just the total number of density of states. I actually haven't divided it by energy. This is just the total number. Right? Because I just took the total number of states divided by L cubed. This is the number density, period. All right? Let me erase that. And so we can then actually get out an expression for what this maximum energy is as a function of our number density particles. That's just doing some algebra, and this turns out to be 3 pi squared 
times n to the two-thirds power times h bar squared over 2m. And I, you know, I hate going back and forth between h and h bar, but it just works out that pi over the pi is inside this h uh, to get rid of it. Um, and it turns out this is a very common expression. You see this in the Schrodinger equation, right? One of the leading terms of the Schrodinger equation is h bar squared over 2m. All right, so this is our maximum energy for a zero temperature gas, or zero temperature degenerate gas. Right? And I've left the mass open here. I could be talking about electrons, I could be talking about protons, I could try neutrons, it just changes the number of n here. And of course, because the mass of electrons is the smallest of that choice, right? That means that this Fermi energy is largest for for electrons. And I started this preface by saying that when we when this three halves kT gets to be too small compared to the essentially the how much you pack these electrons in or protons or something like that, we're going to run into the limit when we get to the when we have the highest Fermi energy when that thermal energy gets below the highest Fermi energy. Highest Fermi energy happens for the smallest mass particle. So we talk about white dwarfs as electron degenerate objects because they have the highest Fermi energy. You end up falling below this limit first for electron before you do it for protons and neutrons. And that's why neutron stars are smaller. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. So can we have like yeah. uh, Fermi energy for small amounts of neutrinos? In principle, yes. The neutrino. Um, yes, in principle you can. Um, because neutrinos don't uh, interact uh, very strongly, there's there's only really one case where you have to worry about the generosity from neutrinos, and that's in a supernova explosion. When you have a sort of wall of neutrinos that are trying to get out at once. That might be a case where you have neutrino degeneracy, but I've never actually, I don't know that I've ever seen that calculation. So that's possible, um, but I'm not sure. But usually neutrinos just leave. They never pile up. Um, electrons get stuck pretty easily. OK, so you know, what I you know, sort of imagine here is a zero temperature gas, which is kind of a made up thing. Right? We do have like very low temperature you know, bosons, ions, and stuff like that. Um, but this is a white dwarf that's just been fusing helium. It's not particularly zero temperature, right? It's very high temperature. And so we can ask, you know, what point do we really have to worry about degeneracy? Right? If it's a high temperature gas, we shouldn't have to worry about the beam of because they should be scattered at all energies, right? They should really expand the distribution out really widely. Um, but remember, this depends on the density. And so we can set a criteria for when does degeneracy matter? Well, that's kind of a ironic statement, degeneracy matter. Um, it happens when the thermal temperature, right, the thermal, I should say the peak thermal temperature, uh, becomes appropriate, uh, becomes, uh, I would say, less than or equal to the this Fermi energy. Right? When the peak of our ideal gas starts to fall below this maximum energy you can have for a zero temperature gas, then you start to move into this degenerate state. Right? And you know, that's easy to calculate. We know what the average thermal energy per particle for ideal gas is. It's 3 halves kT. Uh, we've just calculated uh, the expression for the Fermi energy. It's h bar squared over 2m times 3 pi squared. Now I'm going to replace this number density n uh, with an actual, uh, so let me do this over here. The number density uh, is also equal to the mass density of our gas divided by the typical mass of the particle, or at least the mass of the proton here, uh, times the, uh, and you know, this number density of electrons is the same as the number density of protons. 
So we can just write this as the, essentially, this gives us our mean mass per particle. Right, this is our 1 over mu is z over a. And, you know, this is actually easy number to remember for stuff like carbon or oxygen or nitrogen. Uh, it's something like a half. Because they're typically the total number of nucleons in the particle, in the nucleus. Half of them are protons and half of them are neutrons. The Z just measures the protons, A measures everything. Right? Carbon 12 is 12 nucleons, 6 of them are protons. Oxygen 18, 18 nucleons. Did I get that wrong? 60. Oxygen 16. Eight of them are protons, eight of them are neutrons. Okay? So that's the number density of you know, the heavy things, but it's also equal to the number density of the electrons because they have to equal each other in terms of charges. Okay? All right. So if I put that in, we can put in an actual uh, mass term here. Rho over mh times z over a to the 2 thirds power. Uh, and if I just do some pretty simple rearrangements here, I can write down an expression for the relationship between the temperature and the mass density inside the star. Okay, so just moving the density really over to the side. And if I now explicitly say I'm going to talk about the electrons, that means that this is the electron mass. That's the generate particle that we're worried about. This number works out to be something like 1,261 Kelvin meter squared per kilogram to the two-thirds power. Not quite a natural unit that you normally roll off your tongue, but that's how we get this combination of temperature and density out here. Okay. So this is essentially the combination of temperature and pressure, or sorry, temperature and density. If you're below this number, then that material is starting to become degenerate because the peak of the ideal gas energy below that maximum energy that a zero temperature gas has. And you can already test this, right? Zero temperature means zero, and zero is less than 1261. Good, that works. Okay. But what else happens, right? You can have a very high temperature gas, right, a million Kelvin. But if this density goes up and up and up and up, then you can also fall below the generator. So it's not just for zero temperature gas that we wrote generally. It's also for very, very dense gas. And we calculated this, right? It was 10 to the 9 kilograms per meter cubed. So 10 to the 9 to the 2 thirds power is 10 to the 6. A million Kelvin and 10 to the 6 in this denominator is 1. And that's less than 1261. So even for a million Kelvin, or even 10 million or 100 million Kelvin gas, if it's 10 to the 9 kilograms per meter cubed, you've got a generous gas, even if it's really hot. Okay. All right. So now, just for comparison, uh, the sun, uh, if you do this calculation, uh, T over rho, the core temperature over the core density, remember this is about 15 million Kelvin. This we can also do from our you know, really basically from our, uh, our polytrope relations. Uh, and that works out to be something like 1.5 times 10 to the 5 kilograms per meter cubed. Barely noticing how dense it is, right? Uh, that works out to be something like 5,300 as a ratio in these units right here, which is definitely much less than the degenerate, degenerate limit. So we've never had to worry about degeneracy in the sun because it's simply too low density. Um, but as in white dwarf, we talked about, so we actually we take Sirius B. Sirius B is the white dwarf that we started this, this conversation with. Uh, turns out the core temperature is something like 8 times 10 to the 7 Kelvin. All right. Again, we can get that from the polytrope relations for white dwarf, which we'll derive in just a second. Um, and uh, the core density is the same core density we computed before, right? about 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 kilograms per meter cube, somewhere around there. Right? 10 to the 9 to the 2 thirds power. All right? 10 to the 6, that's 80. And that's definitely degenerate. All right? Um, now, we can actually take this a little bit further and ask at what point 
for any star, does this become an issue? Does degeneracy become something you have to worry about? It certainly does for white dwarfs, but they're kind of special cases. Do we have to worry about this for our main sequence stars? Certainly don't have to for the sun. Okay. But we can use our sort of rough scaling relations that we talked about before that relate the full properties of the star's mass and its radius to its core temperature, core density, and something like that. We can actually get a rough relation for how these things scale. So we're looking for something that relates core temperature over core density to 2 thirds power. Uh, anybody remember, if we're just writing this in terms of proportionalities, um, how temperature to core temperature scales? It's a function of mass and radius. Does core temperature go up or down with mass? Okay, so probably mass to some positive value. Does the core temperature go up or down for size? So if I increase the size, the core temperature goes down. Or if I decrease the size, the core temperature goes up. That's gravity, right? That turns out to be a good rough relation between for core temperature, mass and radius. Remember, the sun is about one solar mass. In fact, it's exactly one solar mass. It's exactly one solar radius. An M dwarf is about a tenth of a solar mass and a tenth of a solar radius, and they have roughly comparable core temperatures, the core temperature required for fusion. So that's why this relation makes sense. Okay? How about the core density? We've actually already talked about this. How does that scale with mass and radius? But very specific, just core density. How would, how would I write a mass radius scaling core density? Hmm? M over R cubed, yeah. That's density, right? Average, core density is proportional to average density. So we can just write that as M over R cubed to the 2 thirds power, right? So this works out to be something like mass to the 1 third power and radius, uh, just radius, okay? And, um, and then uh, you can use a trick that, uh, something that we didn't talk in great detail, but you know, mass and radius are roughly coupled, right? One solar mass, one radio, one solar radius, half, tenth of solar mass, tenth of solar radius. Turns out the relation is closer to uh, radius proportional mass to 0 0.8 power, so pretty close to 1. So if we stick that in here, what we find is that this relationship here scales as mass to 1 third plus 1 eighth, so that's something like 1.1, somewhere around there. Yeah, and we know what the value of this is when this number is one solar mass because we just calculated it. So this, you know, we'll call this this degeneracy parameter. We'll do this p over q two thirds is something like 5,300 times the mass in units of solar radii, solar masses, to the 1.1 power. I love scaling relations. It makes me feel like I can write equations so easily. <laughs> Who cares? The reason you care is that, again, degeneracy kicks in when this is less than 1261, which means it kicks in when you have low mass things. How low mass? Well, this starts to become important somewhere around masses of less than 0 0.3 solar masses. All right? That's still in the end dwarf phase. So even m dwarfs that are happily fusing hydrogen are starting to become degenerate because essentially their densities, uh, well, okay, so it's a little confusing, but their densities are uh, getting higher because you have to shrink the star even more in order to get to the temperatures to start fusion. So low mass stars are more dense for a given you know, object, and so that goes up, which overcomes this fusion temperature limit, which means you start having degenerate objects. So that's why brown dwarfs are almost all degenerate objects, right? They're below 0.3 solar masses. And their temperatures actually start to go down too, so that's also a problem. Okay. Questions on this? Yes, sir? You're saying that temperature drops below the critical value of fusion. Does it have these kind of phases where it becomes partially convected and then Ah, so okay, so this is this is the tricky thing. 
convection, the motion of the gas, is not related necessarily to its degeneracy. You can still have a degenerate fluid. In fact, that's what interior brown works are. They are fluids. They that stuff moves around. Degeneracy just sets kind of where they sit in the sort of, you know, how many particles per unit energy uh, you have. They still have energy, so they still move. So you can still have flows. And so you so so you do have convective flows, but that actually comes not from the degeneracy, but it comes from okay, let me take my opacity. It mostly comes from the opacity, yeah. But of course, opacity goes as density, and so degeneracy goes as density, and opacity goes as density. They are related. Right. Yeah. But I think my question is um, between the hydrogen burning shell and the helium core, let's say, it's burning hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Do you get any kind of dredging when hydrogen fusion does sputter out, as you do in the sort of second main sequence of sputter? Ah, okay. Let's set a hydrogen track. Um, so uh, you usually, again, you only be able to get any kind of dredge up or mixing when you have convection. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking about this point where you have this helium core, okay. inner helium core and hydrogen fusion around the edges, that's still pretty hot, so it's fairly ionized. And and you've lost your hydrogen lines, you just have helium, and it tends to be it actually fewer the, the absorption lines for the for helium is much are much weaker. And so the opacity is actually quite low. Um, and so the, the helium core of the sort of post main sequence phase is radiating. And so is the hydrogen burning shell around it. It's so hot that it's just it's just emitting radiation. But even in brown dwarfs when these when fusion Species for a brief time, just saying the helium core remains on the Well, okay, so brown dwarfs don't fuse. So, right, they know. So, these point three mass stars then. Uh, so, okay, yeah, so these things will take 100 billion years to get to the point where we have to worry about it. So, so the models that show this, you know, they basically still follow the same tracks of, you know, okay. of, uh, of post main sequence stars. Um, but that's a good question. I, because it, it should, it's connected in there, so it should be mixing as well. So they may actually fuse more of their interior than um, uh, than the sun, because you know the sun runs out to a point where it has a helium core that can't get any hydrogen into that hot spot. These things probably still will fill hydrogen in there, so they may they may burn more of their interiors. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I don't know if that's true. Yes, sir. What about uh, like planetary cores? Jupiter's core, Earth's core. Uh, so uh, those are also uh, tend to be degenerate, mostly because their temperatures are so low. So the core of uh, Jupiter is something like 70,000 Kelvin. So that's our estimate. Um, the density is not quite as high because, well, okay. So actually, another way to I can take this back a step. Be, you know that an object is degenerate when you have no reason to. It's, you know, you have no source of energy that's, or no source of pressure to keep it from collapsing, other than degeneracy pressure. So the sun doesn't collapse because there's so much heat produced from fusion that that provides the thermal pressure necessary to keep it, to keep it whole. If brown dwarfs are not fusing, you should just be able to keep squeezing it. It gets hot enough to start fusion. But if you can't. You stop at a Jupiter radius, and then that's it. You can't squeeze it any further. And Jupiter, you stop at a Jupiter radius, and you can't squeeze it any further. Same thing. All right, so uh, so so in that sense, you know they're degenerate because they're not collapsing. So the interior of the Earth is degenerate. The big the floor is degenerate, right? Mostly because of molecular bonds around hydrogen atoms or, or the atoms between them. But the interior core of the Earth is also degenerate because it's not collapsing. Okay. Any other questions? So it's it's not as so you said the floor is degenerate, but that's due to electrostatic forces. Yeah, so that's actually due to the electrons being degenerate in their bound orbital though, orbitals, right? Like, you know, when you break a table, you break its degeneracy, you manage to you know, move it apart because you actually cleave those those bonds. So you change the distribution of the electrons in that in that material. Literally move them apart. Um, but when it's still solid like this, you basically can't squeeze. You can't squeeze these atoms, any, these molecules anymore, because they're set by the degeneracy of the electron bonds between them. But this one is just because they can't. Just because they're fermions, they cannot get the same state. So they. Mm -hmm. It's like electrostatic forces, but it's not. It's well, just it's, it won't collapse anymore into. 
Yeah, I mean, so it's it's an unusual force because it's not it's not a strong force, weak force, gravitational electric. It's it's the fundamental quantum properties of the material that basically resist any further collapse of the object. So it's 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 a pressure because in the sense that it's resisting the gravitational pressure pushing in. It's not a force. But it's not a force. So it's very strange in that sense, yeah. So is it wrong to think about the Theta wave? Because the pressure you're experiencing is electrostatic. When you're talking about degenerate stars, the pressure you're experiencing is like occupational for the particle when you're talking about the Broly wave. Uh, no, so it still works because so the, the bond itself is electrostatic. But you know, if if the electrons were allowed to have any orbital radii they wanted, you can imagine I could just squeeze this squeeze it down as much as I want. Uh, I mean, I still could because the layers are well separated. But if, if I was at the point where it was a crystal, for example, right, I can't squeeze that crystal anymore because the electrons can't get any closer together because they're set by the orbital properties of, of the atoms that they're bound to. So that's what sets the bond lengths. And if, if quantum mechanics was not an issue, those bond lengths could be anything. In fact, they would very quickly become zero because electrons would just go right into the proton. Right? So you have zero bonds. So the fact that we have bonds is another form of this degeneracy pressure because you can't arbitrarily move these electrons any further apart, further closer together. At some point, they just become their minimum separation because of quantum mechanical properties. That's why you have to make it um, Yes, I think that's true, yes. Yeah. It's just weird to think that if something's incompressible, then you call it degenerate. Because the fluid could be incompressible nearly. Um, yes, yeah. Um, I have to admit, I don't know my liquid uh, mechanics as well to, to, to understand the fundamentals of incompressible fluids. Why, if that is a bonding issue, uh, or if that is a, if there's something else going on there. Um, you know, gases are compressible, and they're not they're not interacting as much at the atomic level. So I suspect because liquids do it interact at the atomic level, that's still a quantum mechanical effect. But I, I don't I mean I, I'm just speculating on that. You can come back and tell us. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, okay, all right. So um, all right, so uh, so we can get to that funny zero temperature distribution as long as we satisfy this criteria, low temperatures, very high densities, we start to move into this distribution that looks more like a zero temperature gas. Time. Okay. Um, all right, so um, now in reality, the distribution is a little bit more complicated because it isn't zero temperature. So if I now again plot energy, number density of function energy, this is our zero temperature Fermi gas, which is centered on our Fermi energy, or ends at our Fermi energy. In reality, if you have a finite temperature, uh, you can start moving some of these electrons here out to areas that are beyond the electron Fermi degeneracy. So you increasingly get these sort of melting edges of your distribution to the point where it starts, so you can start pulling some over here, to of course the point where you start getting something that looks like an ideal gas that's much more smooth. But you know, the temperature at which you can make a significant dent in this very square distribution uh, is also equal to the Fermi energy itself, just K times T. Um, and what you find is that for particularly for white dwarf systems, the temperature that you would need to heat this gas up, melting it away from this very square distribution, is extremely high, right? Many 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 kelvins, which is much hotter than white dwarf is itself. And so even though it's not a zero temperature gas, its temperature is so much smaller than this free energy, the ideal gas temperature is somewhere down here, that the particles simply can't get hot enough to escape from this Fermi degeneracy limit, right? mostly because of the density. So this is actually not a bad approximation for the interior of a white dwarf. It becomes a worse approximation with brown dwarfs, because that, the temperature for that is a little bit lower. 
But for white dwarfs, and as we'll see for neutron stars, this very square distribution of the particles, you know, number as a function of energy, is a very good approximation. And it's great because it means that all the things that we use to calculate you know, uh, distributions of statistical properties become very easy to calculate. So for example, we can calculate the pressure as a result from degeneracy gaps. That was the whole point of this in the first place, right? I'm trying to stop this thing from collapsing. So we can calculate this. Well, it's one third times the number distribution. I'm going to write this as a function of momentum because that's how we originally defined our uh, pressure, right? We're integrating over momentum, and it's uh, number density times velocity times momentum. This momentum comes from the momentum transfer as particles hit each other, right? Uh, this n times v is the rate at which particles are, say, hitting a wall, right? So rate times the momentum, momentum you transfer into there. That's a force per area, and it's one third that. So we did this for an ideal gas, right? Um, so we can convert this into an energy distribution because it's just changing uh, changing the terms here, right? So this is just N of E equals N of P D P D E, right? So we can, you know, and this this E is P squared of 2M. So D E D P is equal to P over M is equal to uh, square root of 2me, all right? So we can make the substitution of values, rewrite this in terms of an energy density. Uh, what you'll get is this is equal to one-third uh, times the integral of, oh wait, actually, I think I kept it as np. Did I do that? Okay, sorry. I did something funny in my notes, but so let's see if we can work it out. Okay, right, so this is equal to one third times. I'm going to replace my n of p with n of e d e d p, which I've written down here. All right, square root of two m e. And so this is going to be n of e times square root of 2 m e, all right? p times v is equal to p squared over m, which is equal to 2 e. And dp is equal to all right, so uh, we have dp, dE dp here. Uh, so we'll just invert this. dp dE is equal to 1 over square root of 2me. Uh, so dp is just dE times that. Following. So I combine this p and v into p squared over m. But didn't you have like square root of 2me for p and v? I did. I already put it in here. Okay. So I converted n of p is equal to n, n of e o d e d p. Did I actually not put it upside down? That's probably my problem. Is that what you're talking about? It should be this. No, I feel like you have an extra p n of e. It's entirely possible. So, so we're happy with this conversion, yeah? Yeah. Okay. We're happy with the e d p equals. Oh no, I had this right the first time. Just no question myself. Right. If we move dPDE to dEDP over here, right, the EDP is square root of 2ME. So N of P is square root of 2ME, N of E, that takes care of this term. Yeah. P times V is P squared over M, so there's 2E. And then dP, go back to here, dEDP is just dP over here, square root of 2M over E underneath it. So this becomes dE over square root of 2ME which is nice because we get rid of that stuff, right? Now, we need an expression for n of e. n of e, or actually, say the number density of particles, all the particles, all electrons, is equal to the number density over energy. But we're only integrating from 0 to the Fermi energy, 
and all of the energy states are equally occupied. So this becomes a pretty trivial uh, expression. Uh, this is just N of E times EF, because N of E is actually a constant. So N of E is actually the number density divided by the Fermi energy, which, if you remember my, how I drew that distribution, it's a square. Pretty easy. All right? So pressure becomes, uh, now carrying some of the things out, one-third N over the Fermi energy, because that's a constant. The integral from zero to the Fermi energy of 2E dE. Wow, that's tough. Any help? Right? E, this, this is great. This is easy. It's just EF squared. So this is one-third times the number density times the Fermi energy. Let's assume we're at almost zero temperature. So that's, yeah, if we have a perfectly square distribution like this, then that would be exact. If it's not quite, then you can calculate, you can, you know, sort of tweak this integral so that you have, you know, say you have it this uh, minus some distribution to take account the sort of, sort of flexible part of it. And then you can do sort of perturbation on that number. But for white dwarfs, this is close enough, right? The next order term is extremely small compared to this. Mostly because the Fermi energy is very large. Now, remember, we also have an expression for uh, the Fermi energy, which we wrote down before, which I'm going to write down again. And so we can actually then equate all this stuff together. We get a whole bunch of terms out in front. Um, we get our h bar squared over 2 me, so we'll keep this as a 3. We get our z over a times the mass density over hydrogen mass to the 5 thirds power. Right? So that's just substituting in EF, which is depends on mass density to 2 thirds power, and converting this number density to a mass density, that's just mass times the, or it's just the mass density divided by the mass per particle. And when you do that, you end up with something that depends on density to the 5 thirds. What is this? This is pressure. It's equal to some bunch of constants that I might not care about times density to 5 thirds. What is that? It's a polytrope, right? So that make up -y kind of, oh, let's just do this because it's easy expression for a model of a star turns out to be exactly what you have for a white dwarf. All right? So this turns out to be n equals 1 half polytrope. All right? We solved for the n equals 1 half polytrope in our equations. One of the things that we found in that was that for these kind of polytropes, right, the core density is equal to 6 times the average density. All right? That was a nice, easy one to remember. But more importantly, what we found was that the radius of these polytropes was proportional to mass to the minus one third. So that means that for white dwarfs, as a function of mass, the radius that we measure for them uh, goes down as we get to higher masses. And in the 1960s, this was actually confirmed by looking at um, the gravitational redshift of white dwarf pairs. I don't have much time to talk about that, but basically you can measure how light is Doppler shifted just as it's trying to get away from the white dwarf. And that gives you a measure of the ratio of the mass to the radius. And because they knew the masses because they were binary white dwarfs, they actually could measure the radii exactly, and they found that this was the exact match, that the, mat, the radius goes as mass to the minus one third. So the more mass of white dwarf you have, the smaller it is. Which makes sense, because there's more gravitational pressure pushing in on it. But it's still halted by degeneracy. It's just halted by a higher density degenerate gas because it's been compressed. It all fits together. Okay. So if this is the case, right, then we can have any kind of white dwarf, right? We can have tiny little white dwarfs down here. Right? If this is a solar mass, we can have a you know 10 solar mass white dwarf that is 10 to the minus one third the radius of, a, of the Earth. And I don't see any evidence that this is going to be a problem, right? It can just keep going on forever. Generacy pressure is always going to be there. So why why do white dwarfs stop? Because we reach a higher uh, 
do you reach a, a state where ME is no longer the lowest factor? No, so ME is always going to be the biggest, so this is still always going to be the biggest pressure term, right? If we replace this by MP or NN, MN, that's a factor of 1,000. The pressure, for, the generative pressure term from protons is a factor of 1,000 less. Electrons win every time. They're important. No, that's how we got to this point in the first place. So I've already erased it, so that's probably why it's not clear. But in order to make this calculation, I made one very important assumption, and that that this material is not relativistic. And um, if you were to calculate, remember this is the Fermi energy. This is an energy of the particles in the gas. And if you were to actually calculate what the, this over here. If you actually calculate what the velocity of these particles are at the edge of the Fermi degeneracy, uh, Fermi gas here, this Fermi distribution, right? That's just the Fermi energy divided by 2 Me to 1 half power. What you would find is that at some point, and so you know, we can write down the expression for EF, same way we did over there. Uh, what we would find for something like series B, right, where the density is 10 to the 9 kilograms per meter cubed, Right, we would find that this is something like 2 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Is this really a non or a not relativistic gas? Not at all. So what happens? This just changes my integral over here because no longer am I talking about momentum as the energy is p squared over 2m. The momentum, this, the velocity has one value. It's c because most of these particles are sort of in this relativistic regime. And when you do that, what you find for relativistic gas, the pressure is now proportional to the density to the four-thirds power. Ooh. All right. Basically, it just drops one of the EF terms here. It goes to EF as some, some fractional power as opposed to EF as, as just a linear power. And um, this is an n equals three polytrope, and it is an ideal gas. And what do we know about ideal gases? Well, what can I do to an ideal gas in this room? I can compress it. So once this gas becomes relativistic, which is somewhere about 1.4 solar masses. These things can now collapse. They can be compressed. And at that point, you're no longer supported by generative pressure. Yeah? So the question, uh, you said the average velocity was 2 times 10 to 8. When can we consider something An appreciable fraction of C, right? So even if you get to like a 10 or a half C, you really have to worry about relativistic okay. effects. Yeah. So this is, you know, 67%. Okay. All right. So that's all the time I have now. We'll talk. We'll get into a little more detail about this where this 1.4 solar masses comes from uh, on Thursday. Uh, and I'll see you tomorrow for discussion. You're going to follow me? OK. Oh, yeah. Homeworks coming back. Yeah.